الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, for the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, Ajrullah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif, enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Respected elders, sisters and brothers, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. When you wake up in the morning, every single day, what comes to your mind as to your goal, your mission, your objective, your purpose for that day? We are told that in life we're given sometimes certain tasks, certain responsibilities, and automatically, as human beings, we tend to prioritize some over the other. For example, you may be going out shopping, and there are things that you say, I must buy, and there are things I don't need to buy. And sometimes you end up buying it all anyway. But you prioritize what you need over what you may not need. In life, we are sometimes told that this prioritization takes place. What is important more than what is less important in many aspects and the choices we have in life. The Imma alayhum salam, when it comes to the dua and the way they speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their style and their commitment is to place what is important and prioritize what is needed by human beings. The dua is a treasure but the imam alayhi salam wants you and i to recognize what are essential for you and i to understand and to know why amir al-mu'mineen wa imam al-muttaqeen ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi he says if you want to know the value of a human being then you must measure them by this qeematur rajul the value of a human being ala qadri himmatih the value of the individual is in correspondence to their himma what's himma himma is what drives you what motivates you what makes you click amir mu'minin says that is your value what you wake up in the morning thinking i must achieve if an individual their main concern they live this world their main effort is this world and this materialistic possession. I want to acquire more. I want to become known more. I want to live a better life. If that is the main himma, then the value of that individual is that. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, in another narration, subhanallah, this is sometimes disliked by certain people. But the narration of the Ahlul Bayt says, if your value or your concern is food only, your main concern is food, your value is what comes out of you. That is your value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is your main concern, if that is what really drives you in life, I need to have this food and my food is my priority. In Dua Al-Iftitah, we find skillfully and very brilliantly, the Imam of our time, Al Mahdi Sahib Al Asri was Zaman Ajjallah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. 
describes the exalted attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his sifat, yes, as well as some of the features that you and I need to be aware of that are priority and must be a priority in our life. So many a times you'll find that the dua echoes the Quran. It repeats important messages from the Quran, but this time it's presented in a supplicatory manner. When the Imam alayhi salam says, Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yattakhith sahibatan wala walada, wa lam yakun lahu shariqun fil mulk. Yes, this is found in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra verse 111 says, Alham wa qul alhamdulillah alladhi lam yattakhith walada. Ah. In the dua, there is sahibatan, Wala walada. In the ayah, there is only walada. Then it continues. Walam yakul lahu sharikun fil mulk. Yes, and so on. Now, why is this important? Has the Quran not mentioned sahiba? No. In Surah Al Jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, verse number three, speaks about the jinn testifying to the oneness of Allah. They say, Wa annahu ta'ala jaddu rabbina mattakhada sahibatan wala walada. We testify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord and he does not have any partners and he does not have any children. So therefore, sahiba is used in the Quran. But in that particular ayah, due to the context and perhaps the people being addressed, it does not have sahiba. But the Imam alayhi salam uses the Quranic concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any partners. Allah Taala does not have any, for example, wife or any other association, so to speak. Yes, because to have a partner or a wife indicates haja, a need, and Allah does not have any need. Yes, there is no necessity or any need for this to take place. Why? There is nothing like him. Now. This is in response to those who believe that God the Almighty has a son. God the Almighty, for example, is part of the Trinity and so on and so forth. Declaration of Tawheed is a powerful message found in the du'as of the Ahl al-Bayt. Everything is about Tawheed. The beginning and the end and the middle is all about establishing the oneness and the uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the absolute perfect being. Therefore, if someone asks you today, Tell me about the supplications of Ali Muhammad. Tell him or her, these du'as, the story of the du'as is monotheism and tawheed. It's all that. Yes, that is what the lesson we learn from du'as such as du'a al-iftitah. Now, beautifully, when I recited the verse and says, وَكَبِّرْهُ takbira," The mu'mineen recited what is known as takbiratul ihram This takbiratul ihram Imam Ali Salam in Dua Al Iftitah says we should recite it. And Alhamdulillah, we recite it. This commences the Salah. Yes? This is an important declaration in Adhan and Iqama. This is something mentioned in Hajj and Umrah and other acts of worship. But this has been misunderstood and mistranslated by many. Today, you ask people, what does Allahu Akbar means? The dua says, وَكَبِّرْهُ takbira," Meaning, say Allahu Akbar. There are many who will say, this means Allah is the greatest or Allah is greater. At the first level, this is acceptable. Why? Because many a times, we as believers need to be reminded that the moment I say Allahu Akbar in Salah and outside Salah, I need to be recognizing that there is nothing that has to be what? That has to somehow be placed above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the irony and the hypocrisy is when, when I say Allahu Akbar and in Salah, I am thinking, how much money have I made today? And in Salah, I'm thinking, I didn't do this job and I didn't do that job. I ask you, which is more important, Allah or that job or that money? I am supposed to be declaring Allahu Akbar, yes? That means He is greater. 
So when I am stating this in salah and in my life, the first level of the understanding is what? Is that there is nothing more important, there is nothing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you agree? Yes. It indicates superiority. It indicates more than anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first and first only. Why? Because in life I have many choices. In life I have many options. Many a times the options are Allah or to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes when I go against Allah, it's beneficial for me because I only look at it from a worldly perspective. Sometimes it's very painful, but I have to go with what Allah is pleased with. And so when I state Allahu Akbar, arguably it's the most hypocritical sentence sometimes we utter. Because our lives do not indicate that God is greater than everything in so many decisions that we actually make. Yes, when it comes to, for example, my wealth. Business transactions, dealings with others, Allahu Akbar. Sometimes people like me have to deal with disputes in the community. For example, in the same family, the father has died. You know, they say when there is a will, there is a, a way, yes? I say when there is a will, there is family. Yes? Usually you'll find the family there. Now they're disputing. No, I must have this, I must have this. Between brothers creates huge friction creates a lot of fighting sometimes they don't speak with each other for years yes one oppresses the other one takes the right of the other what happened to allahu akbar a few months ago one of the mu'mineen in london called me and said brother we have our grandmother who is not muslim but our mother she's a revert she's a muslim and all the family are muslim but she, the non-Muslim, has put in her will that I want to be cremated. You know cremation? Burnt. So we are asking, are we allowed to fulfill her wish? We are all Muslim. I said, no. According to Islamic law, we are not permitted to take part in any cremation. We are supposed to bury. He said, but she's Christian. I said, I don't care. It doesn't matter. You and I are believers who must go by Allah's plan. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the body of a human being should never be burnt. Should not be burnt. Went back and forth. Other members of the family called and said, you know, we're finding this difficult. We feel that she will never forgive us. So we want to fulfill her wish. Which is coming first? Allahu Akbar or my desires? Which is coming first? Allah is will or my whims and what I want. It's painful. It's difficult. But there is a conflict that is taking place, isn't it? Alexander the Great was once with his army marching through a desert. He saw a tent. There is a man outside the tent sitting. And the man did not move when he saw the thousands of army coming close to him. So he dismounted from his horse, went towards him, and this man was sitting. So he said to him, oh man, Aren't you afraid? Look at me and my army and the size. Look at what we are doing. You are not you didn't even move. Why are you not afraid? He said, because I am speaking to a being that his army cannot even be compared to yours. It's greater. Yes. He said, I'm, I like what you're saying. So come with me. Be my advisor. Be with me. He said, I will only come if you guarantee me three things. Or one of these three things. He said, what do you want? I'll give you money. He said, no. He said, what do you want? He said, guarantee me tomorrow I will be healthy. Guarantee me tomorrow I will gain my wealth. Guarantee me and protect me from calamities. He said, I can't guarantee this for myself. Let alone for you. He said, then I will stay with the Lord who can guarantee me this. That is my, yes. Number one. Number two, what does it mean deeper? Ja Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi was once with somebody who said Allahu Akbar. He said to him, oh man, do you know what this means? He said it means, the man said to Imam al-Sadiq, it means that God is greater. You know, you see it translated everywhere. Imam said, what does this mean, God is greater? He said, he's greater than everything. Imam said, therefore, you are putting him on a scale compared with his creation. This is not what Allahu Akbar means. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, really? So what does it mean? 
He says, Allahu Akbar min an yusuf. Allah is greater than being described by human beings. He said, because if you say greater, there is a comparison between the creator and the created. This comparison, you're putting them on the same pedestal, same balance. This can't happen. You cannot compare Allah to his creation. Look how deep the Imam alayhi salam is, yes? وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ The Quran says you will not be able to reach an understanding of the superiority and the brilliance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mushkila, the problem with the human being at this level, when we understand Allahu Akbar is this, that you and I unfortunately are not in the state of cognizance to understand that the Station and the maqam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such before us human beings. That state of the heart, if it exists, number one, it humbles you and I in this brilliant way. Yes? Hence, you find some people have the audacity to come and ask for certain things. They came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and said, we want to see a God that we worship. How can I worship a God that I don't see? Imam Sadiq said, no problem. I will show you him. Said, what do you mean? He said, look at the sun just for... A few seconds. He came out of the place. He tried that man. He couldn't. Came back and said, I can't. It's too powerful. Imam said, you are not able to look at that which is created. You want to look at the creator? The idea that exists as a human being. Sometimes we convince ourselves with the false notion of immunity and security driven by shaitan. That we and indeed place ourselves in a moment where we debate or we question God, or we are against what God the Almighty has said or done. Who are we and who is Rabbul Alameen? Yes. That realization is very important. They have, that's why there is a beautiful hadith here from the Holy Sixth Imam, peace and blessings be upon him. He said, they said to him, how do you know Allah exists? How do you know? What is your ma'rif of Allah? Describe it. He said, alim tu. He says, I know Allah watches over me every moment and every second. Therefore, I am in the process of what? Feeling ashamed or embarrassed. And I know the risk Allah has given me, He will not give it to someone else. Therefore, I am happy, tranquil. I know that the, no, the knowledge that I have been given and the knowledge that I acquire, it's for me, yes? So I gain it through hard work. Therefore, I work hard. And finally, he says, And I know that my end is the death. Therefore, I have to write, be ready for it, yes? That hum humility of the human being is of the utmost importance. Now, you know where the problem lies in our lives? is sometimes we place priorities over God. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 24, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا Say, Allah is asking you and I this important question. This is the moment for self-scrutinization and digging deep. The month of Ramadan is the month of introspection. I need to ask myself this question. Allah in the Quran says, and then the dua comes to support it. What does Allah say in Surah Tawbah? Say, is your fathers and mothers and your sons and your brothers and your wives or husbands and your tribe and your wealth that you have gathered and your business your houses that you live. Yes. أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ are they all more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger? Very deep question, huh? I have so many things. Now, I have this choice, yes? Are they greater to me than Allah and His Messenger? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ And to struggle in His path, yes? فَتَرَبَّصُوا If it is, then wait. Allah says, wait. This tarabbas in the Quran means... Expect a severe punishment. Yes? You will wait until Allah commands. Then, what does he say? Allah will not guide those who are wretched. 
Meaning what? If you place any one of these above Allah, you are of the fasiqeen. Quran. Question yourself. When I have to make the right choice for Allah, am I favoring my wealth, my family, my house, my business over Rabbul Alami? And you and I maybe have gone through difficult situations and trials in our life where this may be in place. I remember a very interesting story. And that is happened in America. One of the ulama, bless him, is alhamdulillah still leading a very good Islamic center there. I met him. He told me the story. He said, we were building a huge story in, uh, sorry, mosque in America. And we went to, mashallah, a millionaire, one of the mu'mineen, followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, who is successful in his businesses. And he's doing very well. So we went to him to ask for some donation for this big mosque that we are building for the community. We went to see him. He had just come back from Hajj, subhanAllah. What a great moment. You know, when you come back from Hajj, your heart softened from Ziyara. You want to do good deeds. You want to serve. So this is a great moment. So he was very smart, the alim. Yes. He went at a good time. So he sat next to him. He said, brother, look, this is the plans of the mosque. This is a mosque you know. This is our big community. We need a bigger site. Can you help us whatever you can? He said, no problem. He went. He brought an envelope. He said, Bismillah. So the Mawlana took it, but the envelope was very light. You know, sometimes you see it, it's very light. So he gave it to his uh, companion, he said, take it. His companion was very, you know, the, the advisor of the Mawlana was very, very agitated. He said, okay, I have to see what's in it. So he said, excuse me one minute. He went to the bathroom to open it. He opened it, he came back to the Sayyid, and the man had gone to bring tea, whatever. He said, Sayyid, it's got $114. You know, number of prophets. Uh, number of surahs in the Quran. Yes. I wish it was 124,000 at least. It would have been better. Number of surahs in the Quran, 114. Sometimes we like to play with numbers to suit us. Yes? So, Mawlana said, it's okay. Khalas. Rizq is from Allah. He doesn't want to give. No problem. No problem. We keep going. Alhamdulillah, they went. They built the mosque. They built the center. Everything was fine. He said, one day I was in my office. I get a call from the con uh, county district in that state. Yes, in America. They called. They said, please, you are the biggest center here, Muslim center. We have someone who has died. He has no family. No one willing to look for, you know. And we don't know what to do with his body. Should we burn it? He said, no, 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 no. It's Muslim, yes. He said, I went with my advisor. Same one. We went to the mortuary. Opened the bag. It was this man. Same, same, same. His sons didn't want anything to do with him. They were fighting for the money that he had left. Yes? And now no one to look after him. No one to bury him. No one to do anything. He has just left. Yes? And Mawlana said, looked at him, looked at his advice. said, subhanAllah, Allah gave him a message, a sign. Yes? Place me over your desires and I will look after you. But he ignored it. We went to him with an opportunity for tawfiq. But he dismissed it. Yes? Look at what's happened to him now. What is his wealth, uh, wealth going to help him? Yes. So that is what we have to indeed remind ourselves when we say, وَكَبِّرْهُ Indeed what? Takbira. Now, when it comes to the dua, the dua continues now with five sentences of alhamd. As we said, the Imam alayhi salam wants to demonstrate the importance of praise being in a people of alhamd. So he begins and he says, Alhamdulillahi bi jami'i mahamidihi kulliha ala jami'i ni'amihi kulliha. Praise be to Allah. And the entirety of the praise is what? To him for all of his bounties. Now, what is very important to remind ourselves here is what the Ahlul Bayt constantly say in their du'a, such as Sayyid al-Shuhada about Abdullah al-Husayn sallallahu alayhi wa This du'a i Arafah, do you know what Sayyid al-Shuhada says? He looks at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such humility and he says, Ya ilahi fa'ayyu na'ama'ika ahsa adadan wa dhikra. He says, which one of your favors am I supposed to Count and quantify. Then he begins in Dua Arafah. Yes. He says, I want to, however, bear witness from my conscience to the light of my eyes, 
to the lines of my forehead, to the nasal cavities, to inside my lips, to the mouth as well as the socket, as well as my flesh, as well as my blood, as well as my hair, as well as my skin, and ribs, and nerves, and brain, if I was to, for all ages and for all times, thank you for one of them, I can't, because you have given me the opportunity to thank you. He says, I can't for all times, for the beginning of creation till the end, just for one of these ni'am that you've given me, I'm not able to thank you for. Yes? That's why Imam Ali Salam, the 12th Imam, summarizes beautifully, doesn't he? He says, Alhamdulillahi bi jami'i mahamidihi kulliha ala jami'i ni'amihi kulliha. Now, here, what comes to mind when we recite Dua al-Iftitah is what? Alhamdulillah, for all the ni'am of Allah, the wealth, the health, the security, the wilaya of Ahl al-Bayt, the ability to hold these majalis together in the month of Ramadan, yes, to be able to remember Allah in such a manner, this is a beautiful ni'mah, it's a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are many out there, for example, those who are suffering with the earthquakes in Syria and in Turkey, for example, their mosques are demolished. They are not able to, for example, make ends meet. Whereas Allah wa ta'ala has given us a tawfiq to be able to hold these majalis with dhikr. So we think of these na'am and we think these are the favors. Ah, there's something else. There's something else that we need to dig deeper and be thankful to Allah. Because Imam Ali Salam says, Bi jami'i mahamidihi kulliha. All his na'am. Now you may say to me, okay, I say to you, Allah, whatever you've given me, I am thankful. There is something known as Al-Taful Khafiya. Al-Taful Khafiya means the hidden blessings of Allah. What is the hidden blessings of Allah? The problems, the calamities, the hardships, the tests that He has put us through. In dua, when I say, Ya Allah, I'm grateful for all that you've given me, there needs to be a state of consciousness in my heart to say, I include the bala that you made me go through. I include the pain that you made me suffer. Sometimes people ask, this pain, how can it be al-tafun khafiyya? How can this be hidden pleasure, hidden favors of Allah? I am going through hardship. I'm going through difficulty, yes? How is this possible? Yes, I remember one man who had a disability, couldn't walk properly at the time of what? The Holy Prophet, Rasul al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to complain to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, why is Allah created me like this? I am slow, I can't walk, people laugh at me, I have a disability. Yes, the Prophet used to tell him, be patient, don't worry. But Allah wanted to show him how, one day he was traveling with a number of companions of his, this man. And they left him because they couldn't bear him walking slowly. Yes, so they went far ahead in the desert and he had to catch up with them. When he caught up with them... He saw all of them are being killed because they're being attacked by thieves and bandits. And if he was healthy like them, he would have also been killed. He returned to the Prophet and said, Alhamdulillah that I am disabled. When Allah shows you, then you are grateful. But when you don't know, you question God the Almighty. Allah wa ta'ala takes away for a reason. Some school children one day were taken to a camp, a retreat. Yes, and it was time to eat. So they were presented with soup. When they were presented with soup, they were not given what? Spoons. So it was in a bowl and they looked and it was boiling hot. It was very difficult to drink it just like that. They needed a spoon. So they looked around. Where are the spoons? The teachers were there standing, doing nothing. So they asked them, where are the spoons? They would not answer. Yes. So... Some began to complain, children, what is this camp? What is this retreat? You have brought us here and you have not given us spoons. Some said, ah, oh, may Allah bless my mother. She told me, take a spoon with you. So they went back to their room to bring a spoon. And so there was commotion all of a sudden. After five minutes, one of the teachers came and said, the spoons are behind the curtain. So they removed the curtain and the spoons were there. They gave the spoons to each one. Next day, they did the same experiment. They gave them the soup without spoons. Not one person complained. Do you know why? All of them were waiting like this, silently. So the teacher looked at them and says, yesterday they were complaining, today you're not. They said, because we know the spoons are behind the curtain. Allah is saying, I don't give you something because it's behind the curtain. 
When it's time ready for you, I will give it to you. And if it is not ready for you in this world, I will give it to you for in akhirah. Because the sixth holy imam says, there is no dua that a believer supplicates except that Allah answers, but maybe not in this world. Rest assured, have that iman and faith. Don't lose hope in Allah. Why? Because every dua you ask Allah, 100% guaranteed he will answer. But you will not see it maybe in this world. Yes, sometimes when Allah reserves it in Akhirah, we say, Alhamdulillah, actually I prefer it in Akhirah. Yes, if somebody today, you invest some money and they tell you tomorrow, I'll give you double. But next year, I'll give you 10 times. You say, no problem, I'll wait till next year. I don't want it tomorrow. Allah says, you've got to trust me. I'm not going to give it to you tomorrow or maybe in this existence. But because you have supplicated to me, I will not turn you away. I will reserve this dua and reward you in Akhirah for it. That is the spirit that indeed we need to approach what? We need to approach hardships and difficulties. Why? Because Rabbul Alameen wants us to see ourselves, our hardship, and our weaknesses and strengths. I give this example all the time. Tea, chai. You have seen certain teas made in different strengths, yes? Right? So for example, if somebody comes to you with a chai which has no label on it and says to you, what kind of tea is this? Just if we bring you a tea bag, not the, on the tea, just a tea bag without a label. They say to you, what kind of tea is this? Is this Iraqi tea, you know, really, really strong? Or sadly in this day and age, when you go to Arba'an, you see it's not tea, it's just sugar with a bit of tea in it, yes? Or is it like light tea, Iranian tea as usually light? Or for example, it's a green tea. Which one is it? You say to them, I don't know. There's no label on the tea bag. What do you need to do? To find out. Taste it? No, it's a tea bag. So how do you know what kind of tea it is? You put it in water. Yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you and I in hot water for us to see our weaknesses and strengths. Allah wants you and I. He knows. There's no deficiency in his ilm. But we don't know what is good for me and what is bad for me. So sometimes I go through hot water, meaning hardship, difficulties, pain, suffering, for me to see if it's good for me or not. For me to see also whether I can handle it or not. For me to become a stronger human being. For me to become a better human being. And that's why the dua continues. Here the Imam Ali Salam says, Alhamdulillah alladhi la mudadda lahu fi mulkih wa la munazi'a lahu fi amrih. Praise be to Allah who does not have any opposition to his sovereignty. And there is no one who debates or stands and challenges him to his command. Now, this sovereignty of Allah, mulk, is another fascinating, unbelievably brilliant and important subject that must be present in our minds when we recite dua. What does it mean? Let me give you an example. Once a man was next to Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And then he said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Yes, we are from Allah and to him we shall return. Normally, when somebody recites this, imagine if I today started the lecture by saying, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, you would expect me to say somebody has died. Sadly, we have reserved this ayah only for death. Subhanallah. I always say this, that imagine a husband and wife, mother and father watching TV at home, all of a sudden one of the children comes into the room and says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. They jump, they say, who died? But since when was this ayah about death? Since when? One of the usage is death. And this man next to Ali ibn Abi Talib also was saying, Imam Amir al muminin looks at him and says, Do you know what it means? What does it mean? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He said, No, ya, uh, ya Amir al muminin Tell me, what does it mean? Imam says this beautifully. He says, Inna lillah iqrarun ala anfusina bil mulk. When I say inna lillah, I am testifying, I am demonstrating, I am categorically stating, I am owned and I own nothing. Everything that I have is not mine. Everything that seemingly is mine is not mine. Everything belongs to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillah. Do you know why this is important? Because we are plagued with a disease whereby, whereby when we own things, we think we are the rightful owners of it. And when Allah takes it away from us, we begin to break down and want to give up in life. 
Oh, Maulana, in, during COVID and even before, yes, people when they lost their health or even some businessmen when they lost their business, some committed suicide. Why? Oh, I have lost all my belongings. I cannot live anymore. Hold on a minute. All your wealth didn't belong to you. Allah took it away. It belonged to him. Now it goes back to its owner. Don't despair. It's not yours. Who told you this is yours? Yes. I remember one of the ulama said, I used to tell people, never believe anything is yours. Don't attach yourself to anything too much. Yes. Because if then it's taken away from you, you're heartbroken. Then you'll say, ah. So he said, I loved my ring. You know, a ring I had. I was like, one day I sat at home. I said, ah, where's my ring? And I became sad and said, oh, my ring is lost. And I said, ah, I've got to remember what I'm telling people. At the end of the day, a ring is an attachment. Dunya is attachment. Wealth is attachment. Family is attachment. Allah is saying, none of these belong to you. All belong to me. I give it whenever I wish, and I take it away whenever I wish. And that recognition is an antidote for depression when we lose things. For anxiety when things are taken away from us. Yes? This inna lillah is indeed very powerful. It's not a sentence only to say at times of grief or times of what? Death. It's a sentence to say all the time. Because when I say inna lillah, it affirms in me that I will never be attached to anything because anything that I have is not really mine. And Allah wa ta'ala can take it whenever he wishes. Yes. This is a very important realization in our lives that we must, must understand. Then he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ إِقْرَارٌ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِنَا بِالْهَلَاكِ It's to testify that we will die definitely. It's a story of this world, yes? قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاءُ Oh Allah, you are the owner of all things to be owned. You have sovereignty over all sovereign things. You give power and kingdom to whomsoever you wish and you take it away for whomsoever you wish. Yes. May Allah bless the soul of the ruh of this great scholar of ours, Ayatullah Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Rudwan Allah Ta'ala Alayhi. Shaheed al-Sadr was martyred by the despotic, tyrannical, savage regime of Saddam on the 9th of April 1980. In his palace, he bought him, he bought the Shaheed Marja al-Taqlid, and he bought his sister Amina, Bint al-Huda, yes? And he executed them in his own hands. I spoke to the person who buried the Shaheed in Wadi Salam, and he said to me, he had to carry his body a few times. I spoke to him in 2003. He said, only a few months ago, I took out his body and is entirely intact. Nothing wrong with it. I said to him, how did you see his body? He said, wallah, I saw that his neck has been severed. So this la'in said, I will do what Yazid did. Yes. He came and severed the head of Shahid al-Sadr after shooting him. Now, he wrote a letter to Saddam. Shahid al-Sadr wrote a letter to him. He said to him, this arrogance of yours, this tyranny of yours, this oppression of yours, you will see Allah will humiliate you. You think that you own, but Allah will destroy your life in this world. Be, be warned. Look at the vision, the wisdom of our ulama. What happened? Exactly 23 years to the day of the Shahada of Ayatollah, Baqir al-Sadr, exactly 9th of April 2003, Saddam collapses and the regime ends. This is not a coincidence. Humiliation after humiliation, then he's dragged out from a hole, that he is hiding himself in the hole, he's dragged out and executed a few years later. The realization, therefore, is that what? Death is coming to every human being. That's not something that we can indeed run away from. So we are encouraged in this particular important statement in Dua al iftitah to say, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, Alladhi la mudad lahu fi mulke. This ownership, Ya Allah, belongs to you, and therefore I recognize and submit to this key important realization. Now, as far as the social story. And the lesson to be learned in this particular regard is the following. One of the ulama says that in Najaf, many, many years ago, there were two students in Hawza 
who used to go on Fridays out of Najaf Kufa, just a bit like, you know, enjoy themselves, just, you know, have a good time sitting and talking on a day that is, what, off. He says they both went, they both were studying in the Hawza, and they usually take with them back in the time, they usually take with them what is known as Qalam Dan. Qalam Dan in Farsi means this pen, or pe uh, you know, a stick which is used as a pen, which you then you have to dip in the ink. You know, back in the time, they didn't have like these pens that we have today, right? So they have these, so they, they make them out of wood, and they carry them wherever they want, go with a pot of ink in case they remember something or they see something, they jot them down. But of course, it was so difficult at that time. Imagine, you have to dip it in ink and then write. Maybe some of you already have used to use this, right? You write two words and it finishes. Then you dip it again and you continue. Subhanallah, our ulama have written many hundreds of books. How difficult it was. And today, you can dictate. You can sit there and talk and what? Your voice becomes text and typed for you. Yes? So much easier now. Anyway, he said they took this particular qalam dan with them or what they, want, they usually do. So one of them asked the other. He said, did you bring the qalam dan today? Did you bring it with you? Yes. Our deen Farsi means, did you bring it? Yes. The other person is difficulty in hearing. He doesn't hear properly, right? So he had this qalam dan as what? As dan dan. Dan dan in Farsi means teeth. Yes? So he said to him, what do you mean did I bring my teeth? Yes? Back in the time, they didn't have these false teeth, by the way. And today, maybe this is an okay question. Because if you're not, wear, if you're not got the proper teeth, you wear the false teeth. Back in the time, yes, maybe 70, 80, 100 years ago, this was, so what do you mean I didn't bring my teeth? Yes, they're here. So that man looks at him and says, I know you can't hear me properly, but can't you think properly? Why would I tell you don't bring your, why haven't you brought your teeth? Yes? So the man put his head down and said, let me be honest with you. Sometimes when you're difficulty in hearing, you don't think as well properly. Yes, so that's the reason. This particular individual said, I just said this to him, like you don't think, you don't hear, but also you don't think. What's wrong with you? Yes. He said, I went a week later, I lost hearing in one ear. I couldn't hear anymore. This is the other person who had good hearing. Yes. Now, Quran in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49. Says, Ya ayuha ladina amanu, la yeskar qawmun min qawmin, asa an yakunu khayran minhum. In today's world, we are influenced by Western practices on comedy, on movies, Hollywood, Bollywood, where people mock and ridicule each other. For example, they see something in somebody and then they laugh at them. Look at you, you're too short, you're too tall, you're too fat, you're too this, you're this. Your complexion. So they take, they, they mock the physical features or what? Or certain characteristics of human beings for the sake of comedy, for the sake of making others laugh. Allah says, this is haram. You cannot mock people for who they are. Or even there, for example, statements, whatever. You have to do amar bil ma'roof and an munkar. Don't do it in a mocking way. Say it in an appropriate manner. For example, if somebody said something that they shouldn't have ghiba, backbiting, say, brother, sister, that's not right. That's not mocking. But to say, look at you. You can't even think. Look at you. You're this. Look at And these nicknames. Allah says this may placing nicknames that makes others laugh. Yes. For example, I hear sometimes people calling this person, he's a fatty. That person, he is bald. That person, he is, I don't know, chatty. What's this? These are all hugely problematic. The Quran condemns these kinds of what? These kinds of expressions made to make fun of people. Anyone. Yes, anyone. Now, there was a wife of the Holy Prophet by the name of Safiya bin Tahayi. She was Jewish from the Jewish tribe. And the Prophet of Islam married her. She came to the Holy Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, they're mocking me. They're saying that you are, you've got Jewish background and you are Jew and they're laughing at me. 
The Prophet of Islam was, of course, upset about this. But he said to her, go and tell them, who is better than me? My uncle is Musa and my husband is Muhammad. Yes? You want to laugh at me? This is my state. Yes? The idea that emerges is what? We have to be very careful because sometimes these habits develop. Sometimes these traits become second nature. We see something, we think it's worthy of laughter, immediately we say it without even thinking. And we are accumulating these sins. And it's causing what? It's causing dissension and disunity and breaking the hearts of people and society. And some get upset and others, Islam wants to perfect our akhlaq. Our mannerism, the way we deal with others with respect and with honor. Yes. Now, the final point, and that's the fiqhi reminder, and that is regarding some of the mistakes that happen in namaz a jama'a, salatul jama'a. Two things I'll mention only, yes, that there are common errors that people unfortunately don't pay attention to when they're praying congregatory prayers. The first is what? Is when it comes to recitation in salah. So sometimes some mu'mineen and mu'minat believe just because you're praying salatul jama'a, you don't recite anything during the whole salah. You just stay silent. Whereas, of course, the ruling is only Surah Al-Fatiha and the other Surah you don't recite. Everything else you must recite. Everything else must be recited by the Ma'mum, yes, and the Ma'mumin. The one behind, yes. Those who are following the Imam must recite that dhikr in, in, in Ruku' and Sujood and Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Tashahud, Taslim, all of it must be recited. Number one. Number two, this is a bit more of a common problem. Which is what? When you are in the Maza Jama'at, and for example, you are in Ruku'ah, and now what happens? You are saying, Subhana Rabbi al azim wa bihamdi. You are not, for example, blessed as you are here where the Imam has a microphone. Sometimes you are in a congregatory prayers, Imam doesn't have a microphone, and you are way at the back. You don't know when he stood up to say, Sami Allah liman hamida. So you stand up, because mashallah, the Imam is going super slow speed. Yes? And you are saying, okay, you know, you stand up and the imam is still in ruku'. You agree? What do you do then? You have to wait. So there is an opinion here. You wait until the imam stands. Any other opinion? If the ruku' is delayed, what do you mean? Ah, if the Imam is, mashallah, reciting Surah Baqarah. <laughs> you can't recite Surah Baqarah? Maybe you can, but it's just a general dhikr. But if he's reciting Allahumma salli ala, dua Abu Hamza, for example. <laughs> yes? So, if he is reciting this too long, then you said, you think you, think you should go? But you are adding another ruk'ah, it's okay? You already did your ruku'ah. Now you stand up, you go back in ruku'ah. Ah, so you can see people are not sure, either that or they said, you know, we are tired, yes? The ruling of his eminence, Ayatollah Sistani, please pay attention to this. If you stand up from ruku' or you sit from sujood, if you sit from sujood or you stand from ruku' and the imam is still in ruku' or the imam is still in sujood, you must go back. You are not allowed to stay. But there is an exception. He says there is an ishkal if you don't go back deliberately. But the exception is if you stand and he is about to stand, or he is already, sorry, he's already started to stand, then you don't go back. But if you stand and he is already in ruku', you must then go. This is not adding another ruka' because what happens? You are in a state in Salatul Jama'ah. This Salatul Jama'ah has these rulings, yes? Because you must be connected to the Imam. And if you proceed the Imam, that's a problem. Now, this Allahu Akbar that we recite at the beginning of Salah, you must hear the Ra of Takbiratul Ihram before you say Allahu Akbar. Similarly, at the end of Salah, there are Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, they do this. I've seen them, right? So the Imam is reciting Tashahud and Taslim, and he hasn't yet finished Salah. They recite Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, then they wait. To hear the Imam finish. You've seen that? Yes? That's the problem. It's not going to invalidate the Salah, but what's happened for them is they've left the Jama'ah and now it's Farada. 
So what you need to do is, you need to wait for the Imam to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, before you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, to get the thawab of jama'at salah. That's important. But the more important thing is to realize and to recognize that when it comes to the Imam, when he is in sajda or in ruku' and you stand before him, yes, nothing you should proceed before him in actions in salah. But you can proceed in words if it is not Allahu Akbar or the Taslim. Meaning what? That for example, the Tasbih, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wala ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, you recite it quick. Okay, no problem. You recite before him and you wait. Yes? There's no issue. Or the Tashahud, for example, in the second Rukah, you're about to stand for, yes, uh, Maghrib. No problem. You recite quicker than the Imam. But actions, no. And Takbiratul Ihram, no. And the end. Taslim, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All the Imam must say it first, then you do it after him. May Allah wa ta'ala bless you all and accept our deeds with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.